neighbor tells you about the unstable man in the cul-de-sac who claims to have been abducted by aliens. And then there's the woman in town who claims to see Bigfoot all the time. Your boss, who you greatly admire, confides in you that he has started speaking with his wife daily when he gets home from work. She died eight years ago. It's hard to believe this stuff, and you write these stories off as overactive imaginations. Are these people seeking attention, or are they a bit unstable? No matter what you think, if you're like me, you walk away wondering, what if that was true? The What If It's True podcast features stories by ordinary people like you and me. Something has happened to them, something so strange they are in agony unless they tell others. My name is Cameron Buckner, and the What If It's True podcast is available at whatifitstruepodcast.com and on all available podcast apps. a second how you doing tonight man i'm doing good we survived storm again in 2022 again <laughs> man we've been getting a lot of tornadic type weather coming yeah. through here this year i think yeah. you brought it down from martin tennessee well it's still going through there too so <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know <laughs> Uh, I guess we want to start off. I just saw on Facebook where our friend Moogs um, lost his father today. His father's been really sick. And um, so we want to send out our condolences to him, his family, and their friends. So, and we're sorry to hear hear this news. We, we know that he's been... Um, really sick and i'm i'm just glad russell was able to make it back to arizona from florida and, and be able to to spend these past few months with him yeah definitely but on a lighter note man we got a real treat tonight don't we oh yeah we've got tim kumbo baker He's got story after story after story. They don't even know where to start without somebody asking him about something. <laughs> Let's just wind him up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and for those of you that didn't make the meet and eat, Tim was there and he interacted with everybody, answered questions, told stories, and it was a good time. And I'm sure <laughs> we didn't touch a tenth of what he what knowledge he has but <clears throat> what can he do put him on again that's what we can do yeah absolutely <laughs> Howdy. Kubo, how you doing doing better now than i was that's good <laughs> y'all like to kill me up there to the lbl hell <laughs> pat, rance about, pat, pat rance about finished me off <laughs> and old mark green <laughs> Uh, yeah, Kumbo yeah. was in the hospital for a few days with some heart problems. Yeah, yeah I was in there five days. Mm. And, uh, yeah. It was Should all been, food. Yeah, and all that good food. <laughs> <laughs> Too much of it. <laughs> no, I hadn't, I hadn't been eating a whole lot. I've lost more weight lately. And, uh, but, uh, well, 
I found it, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I worked with this guy, and he, he was really funny. And uh, our supervisor, she come in there, and she talked about how uh, – she had been going to the gym and losing weight, and he asked her to stand up and turn around. And when she turned around, he told her, he said, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> she was upset. That's a good way to lose some teeth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or your job. <laughs> uh, yeah, that too. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Well, we were really excited that you were able to make it to the meet and eat. And I I have had people just contact me telling how much they enjoyed just sitting around talking to you. Because when you talk to Kumbo, you've got his undivided attention. It's just you and him when he talks to you. And I think that's a excellent characteristic and and it really just shows all you know all the response that i got and and how much everybody loved talking to you well i appreciate that i wish i'd been feeling better i i feel like i didn't give some folks the attention that i wanted to you know that i didn't get to talk to some folks as much as i wanted because i wasn't feeling good and uh i didn't know that i was right on the verge of of, uh, almost having a heart attack. I didn't have one, but I came close. Wow. And uh, I found out later, but yeah, I I just, I wasn't feeling very good. And that cold weather was making it even worse. So uh, I sort of stayed holed up in the booger buggy for for more than I wanted to. (laughs) Well, everybody did on that (laughs) one night for sure stayed curled up because it was cold. Yeah. Yeah, and I hated that one night that we left. Y'all were having a podcast, and I didn't get the word that, that y'all were going to do a live cast. And we jumped in the truck and took off and spent three hours riding around for nothing. All we got was cold. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> happens. <laughs> yeah, I think we had one tiny little response, you know, way off down at the place we call the Velociraptor Field. We had a couple of responses uh-huh. out on the uh, sort of northeast part of that area. And that was, that was be- it for the whole night. We didn't have any anything else at all happen. Yeah. So we wasted yeah. time. And I found out next morning that y'all had that podcast. I said, dad, gum it. <laughs> I, I, there's no way I'd have gone out that night if I'd have known y'all were doing that. So uh, I apologize again for that. Oh, and, it's no big but, deal. No, no big deal at all. No, we were uh, wanting we, everybody to have fun and do their own thing, and you, yeah. y'all were doing it, so it ain't no big yeah. deal. Yeah, yeah, we uh we went back to several places where we've been before, and went to a couple of new places as well. And uh, like I said, still didn't get any any results. It was just too cold and windy. Those boogers were holed up. Yeah, you know. Well, y'all said you wanted me to talk about just about anything, and one that uh. Uh Oh, I went away. There we go. (laughs) Mark's a little rusty on these controls. He ain't been on there in about a month. All right. Well, um, one of the uh, stories that I was wanting to tell is one. I I don't think I've ever told it on any kind of a podcast or anything before, but it was an investigation I did where they had some sightings down um, Along the in a little community that's um, along the Missouri River, um, down just sort of um, it's on the north side of the river, not very far east of Jefferson City, Missouri, which is the the capital of Missouri. And um, the river bottom down there is you've got the river, and then you've got a it's got a bank, and then there's a long flat you know long floodplain that goes back you know where you are anywhere from quarter of a mile to a mile or so back from the river. And it's, you know, that's all agricultural fields. And then there's the, then there's the, uh, some steep hills and bluffs sort of stepped bluffs that, that uh, rise up 
several hundred feet um, out of the, the, the floodplain area. And, um, and right up on top of this, one of these little, little bluffs here, there's little towns dotted all up and down through there. And one of the little towns that um, it sort of died on the vine, it used to be a thriving uh, little community probably, you know, back probably 75 years ago. And now there's hardly anything there. There's no businesses there at all, but there's a very few houses, but um, um, this family had had, uh, they were very, very terrified. They had had some um, incidents where uh, this booger had been coming up or this Bigfoot had been coming up to their nine-year-old daughter's window at night and scratching on the screen of the window. And the little girl would, would um, sometimes she would hide under the covers. Other times she'd jump up and go, running into their into their bedroom and you know you know mama and daddy there's a, there's a monster outside my window and they just poo-pooed it you know and and they'd take her back to bed and she wouldn't want to go to bed and they'd take her back to bed with her it'd be gone they wouldn't see it and one night they'd put her to bed you know i don't know about 9 30 9 30 and they were up doing something and they had a couple of dogs that stayed in the house and the dogs were standing out in the hallway outside her bedroom and they were their hackles were all standing up and they were they were growling real low and quiet and they said ordinarily these dogs if anything strange is around boy they just go after it like crazy you know like if you know somebody rode up in the yard or something or or there was a, some kind of varmint out in the yard. These dogs go crazy. But these dogs were out in the hallway and growling. And they sort of had their, a lot of times when a dog's not sure of itself, even though it might act like it's putting up a, you know, they're ready to fight, their tail will be wagging slightly. And, and there's that indicates that they're sort of unsure of themselves, a little bit scared. Their tails were down. Their tails were not standing up like they would if they were, ready to attack whatever it was and the uh the father there he recognized he said something ain't right you know and he walks into the little girl's room and um he sees this damn thing they're looking in her window and and it's up very close to the window and it's it's tall enough that it's looking over the top of the 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 sash there where this has got the screen in it so he wasn't having to look through the screen oh and they've got a yard light out in the yard out there so he could see it clearly and um said it was huge and his fa its uh, shoulders were wider than the than the window and it scared him real bad and he flipped the light on and when he did uh it turned and and I took off out of there with well, a the guy. He was terrified at first, but then he wanted to make sure it was gone. So he gets a gun and a light and goes out and looks around and doesn't find anything. So the next day they went out there and he said the grass was tromped down where the thing had been standing. And then he realized how far it was from the ground up to the daughter's windowsill. The house had a basement underneath it. And uh, anyway, he got to measure and he went back in and, and looked where the thing's head was uh, there in the window and then went outside and measured from the top of its head down to the ground. And the thing was a little over 10 feet tall, he figured out. And he said the head on it was enormous, uh, huge, big head, huge, big shoulders, wider than the window. And anyway... He got to looking around and he found down at the lower end of their yard um, a beat down trail that went down into the woods uh, along that slope there between the, the top of the, I guess, you, I don't know if you call that an escarpment or whatever, but the, the top of the bluffs in the, in the hill there and going down into the agricultural fields down at the bottom. And there was a road that, that, 
that went along the north side of their yard and then a side road that turned on the west side of their house and went straight down the hill to the farm farmland. And out in the backyard was an old smokehouse. So it was about, I heard about it about a week or so after this happened. And, um, and that weekend I went down there and met with the, um, with the uh, family. So I got to looking around and I found this trail that, oh, now I got down there probably about 11 o'clock in the morning and it was a real pretty bright day and it was, um, it was late summer. So the, the leaves are still on the trees. And when I got out of there and just as soon as I got out of there, I felt sort of creepy, like something was watching me. And when the family came out and we were walking around out in the yard, um, my hair was standing up on the back of my neck and I had chili bumps up and down my arms and <laughs> something was watching us. Well, I noticed the mother was walking along and she was like this, like this. And, uh, and she was doing like this. I said, what's the matter? And she said, she said, my skin is crawling. So, something's watching. Something's looking at us. And I said, I agree with you a hundred percent. And, and, uh, Look here, I got chili bumps on me right now. I don't know if you can see it or not. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, I, I walked around, and um, I actually uh, went back up to my truck, and uh, I asked them if they minded if I put on a pistol, and um, and they said no. And anybody that's been in the field with me knows that it's exceedingly rare that I carry a weapon, but. I, f I felt like I needed one. And um, so I put on a weapon. And plus, I figured if somebody's watching us, since I did it right out in the driveway in clear view, that that would be sort of a deterrent. And so I go walking around, and the guy took me down and showed me where this trail went down in the woods. And I walked down in there maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 yards. And he and I did. And even he got to feeling. The, getting the willies and um I'm trying to remember what dog I had with me then. Um I had Bo with me. That was when Bo was still alive. And of course Bo wouldn't even go down there. He he was up at the truck in the truck. And uh <laughs> down there with me when I first got there. He was he was back up at the truck or or something. But uh we went down there a ways and you could tell that something big had been going up and down there because it was, we could walk down through there without even getting hit by limbs or anything like that. And, uh, hang on just a second. Jake's out there barking his head off. I'll be right back. Just a that cane bow and them dogs, you can't take him nowhere. Uh, uh, I, I tell you what, it's really good to see, really oh, no. big monkey oh. in our chat yeah uh, so hey we appreciate you stopping by dave and uh and we can't wait to have you on again we gotta have you on i tell you i love every other friday whenever <laughs> whenever he puts out a video it is yeah. they're awesome i i just wait for them oh is, is the chat go, yeah i, I can't see look it. at it though you might get oh, distracted. Okay. All right. Well, I can't see it anyway. <laughs> too many, too many women in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we go down in there and we go down in the woods and, um, and you know, it, it was just creepy. My skin was crawling the whole time and, uh, didn't ever hear anything. Didn't ever see anything, but that's part of the problem. We didn't hear anything. And, um, uh, so, uh, we came back up. And I saw that old uh, uh, smokehouse. I thought, well, there's Mary Fabian and uh, old Tom Killeen. Yep, Hollywood. And, uh, yep. But anyway, so I went up there and, and opened the, pulled open the door on that old smokehouse. And <laughs> the, 
the, that smokehouse floor had been dug down about two and a half feet, something like that, maybe close to pushing three feet. Well, I've lost about 50 pounds since that picture was taken. That movie was made. I found but, it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so, and what was interesting is I could see the finger marks in there where they had, those boogers had been in that old smokehouse scooping up that dirt with all that fat and, and salt and everything in it. And, um, and uh, in fact, it was, they were right on the verge of causing the old smokehouse to cave in, you know, to fall over. But, uh, but I've seen that in, in other places I've learned whenever I'm out doing an investigation and there's no smokehouse around go in there and look in it and see if they've been in there digging the dirt out of the bottom of it. That's very, very common. And uh, cause that the dirt this in the bottoms of old smokehouses, they're full of all kind of, the dirt's full of fat and, and a lot of salt and the boogers need both. They love it. And they'll, they'll just keep digging and digging. They'll come back to it for years and years and years once they find it. But, uh, uh, so that, that was interesting, uh, you know, seeing that. And um, um, the guy said that when they bought that house, that there was all kind of old junk and crap piled back in the backyard. And he said uh, that that there was just all kind of crap piled all around that old house and they couldn't even get into it. In fact, he said when they finally dug it out and went in there, he found an old uh uh, laying, up, laying up in the top of the smokehouse, an old 22 rifle that was all rusted up and everything. Hmm. Up there, I don't know, but he showed it to me. But um, uh, anyway, um, uh, the people were, were really, really spooked, and they wanted to know if, if it really was a Bigfoot. And I told them, I said, unfortunately, probably so, especially, especially when they looked in the smokehouse and you could they could see where it had where the boogers had been in there scooping that dirt out. I mean, you could clearly see it's, you know, finger marks and it's fingernail in, in, in places and stuff. And you could tell by the width of the, where it'd been scraping in the dirt, you know, what huge hands it had. And uh, that was, and the little girl had gotten so scared, you know, after the parents had seen it, that she wouldn't even sleep in there anymore. So they, but, I didn't even want, I, my, I had intentions of hanging around there till after dark, but I was so creeped out by four o'clock in the afternoon that, um, you know, the, that I didn't want to hang around there. And, um, so, uh, uh, and I was by myself and like I said, Bo was no help. Uh, I couldn't even pry him out of the the truck. And so, uh, I, I left there with the intent of, of going back down there and, you know, get old Travis day or, you know, some of those guys, a couple of guys to go with me. Cause, uh, I just figured if you were down there by yourself at, sitting out there at night, that something's going to happen. Something not yeah. so good. And, um, cause that, that place had one of the, one of the creepiest feels to it during the day that, uh, that I've ever been. And now interesting thing when I, um, Later on, got a couple of guys that, that we were going to go down there. I tried to contact the people. Um, they had uh, they had moved, and someone else had bought the house. And so uh, I said, "Well, heck, you know." I said, "Can we contact them and see if we they might be interested interested in, in us coming down?" Well, I couldn't ever get a hold of them. So, um, um. I, I was down in Jeff City on business one day, and I got done about about one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon. And when I came across the river there on Highway sixty three, I turned. Um, There's one of the, a road that goes to the east down there, sort of following the river, and I turned down it and went on down there. And it didn't. Once I got across the river, it didn't take me very long to get down to this house. And there was a car in the driveway, and so I just went up, and knocked on the door, and this lady came to the door and. And, uh, she, uh, I told her who I was and asked, told him that I had been down there at the request of the previous owners. She said, oh yeah, that they, that, uh, that they knew them and that they had told them about that stuff going on down there and they didn't believe it. 
they said they'd been living there just, you know, a couple of three months, but there were already weird things happening there. And, um, and I asked them if, um, if they would mind if, if we came to myself and two or three other guys came down there and just, you know, hung around at night some and see what we could see in here. And she didn't mind. So by the time that we got a time lined up that we could go down there, I called them and uh, uh, they'd moved. (laughs) 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 And so the next time I was down there, I went uh, in, in about a year or so passed. And I was down there and I went by that place and checked on it again. And that place had been bulldozed down and hmm. you can go down there now and you can't ever tell that there were, you can't hardly tell that there was ever a house there other than just an empty field, an empty lot, you know, with woods around two sides of it. But, uh, it's, uh, it's probably all grown up now. That was back. I don't know. That's back, uh, early two thousands. That's probably about Oh three, something like that. Maybe Oh four. The, Last time I was down there, may possibly, yeah, it would have been. Oh, I don't know. No, I'm wrong. I, I guess I was. I probably was down there as as late as mm, maybe '07 or so. But you can you can try to look for it now on Google Earth or Google Maps. And you can't even see the place. It's uh, wow. it's it's so grown up. You know, nobody's there. The little town there was. It's uh, a lot of those little bitty towns in Missouri. They're getting grants to demolish, to knock down those old, old abandoned houses. It's amazing. You, you ride around rural Missouri, the number of, um, of abandoned houses out there. And every time I see one, I think that's good booger hideout. (laughs) Um, But a little town that I lived in for a while there, a little town of Ethel, Missouri, uh, they got a grant. And they came in there and knocked down a bunch of houses. And, uh, little town that I work near, Shelbina, Missouri. Uh, no, excuse me, Shelbyville, Missouri. They knocked down probably two thirds, maybe three quarters of the houses in town. And uh, <laughs> Dan Ricky, <laughs> there's your buddy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dan, they're dusting crops out here next to me, and I was thinking about you today several times. <laughs> They're run. Dan Dan Ricky invented the. He built the very first turbo prop powered crop duster, and I, I saw one almost just like his, uh, working out uh, east of the west of the house today. So, uh, yeah, yeah, my hair. What I got left of it is pretty <laughs> silver. <laughs> but, it uh, happens. Yeah, it does. That's but, why uh, I wear a cap. Yeah, my dad's hair turned silver when he was before he was thirty, and all his buddies tease him all the time. He always said, well, "I'd rather it turn gray than turn loose." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, but anyway, uh, so that was uh, uh, one of the few investigations that I got to do right there along the Missouri that part of the Missouri River. Um, I. I did some in a couple other places, but uh, along the Missouri, but that little area there, I've always wanted to go back to it, and uh, and I never have gotten the chance. I and, uh, and I can't get that sorry lazy Travis Day to get up off of his his butt and get down there. He doesn't live uh, a little way. From it. I'm just messing. Uh, hey, you, Mike Travis, you you're watching that. <laughs> he might do it. A little boy's tough, man. I, he's somebody I don't want to pick on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I say that a lot. Shane, Shane Carpenter, he does the MMA stuff too. And I'm like, yeah. you know, used to 30 years ago, whenever you're our size, you don't really worry about a little guy. Exactly. But nowadays, yeah. that little guy yeah. puts you on the ground real quick. <laughs> you got that right. Yeah. 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 No these doubt. two. Ignorant hound dogs of mine get in there. They have MMA just about every night, and I have to get on them. <laughs> get in here, knocking stuff over. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is my. And I see. I, I I guess if anybody remembers where I was at the last show I was on, is a lot different than here. I'm in my temporary digs out on my farm right now. 
I'm getting ready to build a, bond, a barn dominium. Or waiting something. On the, waiting on the Bigfoot to come around. Oh, I don't have. They already been here. Hey, my very first night here, they they greeted me, and this yeah. this is what's crazy. Anybody's anybody that's uh, heard me talk very much, heard me talk about the tree out in the field here, this just right northwest of here, that my grandfather took me out to when I was only like around three, and he told me he said uh, he said boy, he never called me my name, he just called me boy. He said boy. You see that tree right there? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, or, or I don't know what you say when you're three years old. <laughs> I don't know if I said yes, sir. Or not, but but I, I probably did say yes, sir, because I was scared of I him. Bet but, you uh, did. <laughs> I said, yeah, I see that tree. You know, and he said, those catamounts sit up in that tree and watch us. And every time I come back here, they jump down and run off down that holler right there. And, uh, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to hear about you back here trying to, uh, climb on that tree. Well, dad gum at that age, I hadn't even thought about climbing a tree. Uh, and, and then he said something was really weird. And he said, he said, if I ever hear about you bringing your little sister back here, I'll tear you over your end up. My <laughs> sister was still in a crib that, that I mean, she would just, I don't even know if she was two years old then. And, uh, and <laughs> I mean, even at that young age, I thought, huh, bring my sister back here. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, he died not very long after that, and uh, I think he knew he was was gonna get ready to pass, and he was just trying to instill some stuff in me. But uh, yeah. now, interesting thing, very first night out, the very first night I spent out here, just here, in the, this is since I moved back out here just in March. Um, it was raining, and I was backing the truck into the front porch, you know, getting the back into the truck tailgate up close to the steps as I could and um and uh, you know my I got a backup camera on my truck but it you know because I've been in the rain is all water and crap and mud and stuff off the driveway and the road coming up here and I couldn't see my backup camera and with all the crap blowing against uh, against the windows I couldn't see my rear rear mirrors so I rolled down the two front windows well, I rolled down all the, I'd roll down all four windows in the truck. Joe and Jake, my two German shepherds were in the back seat. And so I, I'm backing up and I, I'm looking at the side mirrors. And I noticed when I was looking over here to the right, that Joe and Jake were up here and they were looking out the, looking out the side window, looking off in that direction, sort of the Northwest direction. And and I realized I was hearing something. So I just stopped. I took my foot off the gas and, and stopped. And, um, and, and I heard coming from coming. I heard this, you know, long round out, you know, and it, it went on for about 20, 30 seconds. I said, Holy crap. But what was funny is as soon as I quietened the truck down and the dogs could hear it, they both threw it in reverse and backed all the way real fast, all the way across the seat till their butts ran into the <laughs> back door on the driver's side. And, and they stayed back over there. They weren't up there sticking their heads out the window. And then it, and then what was crazy, and there was about a 10, 15 second pause. And then it let loose again, this time for only about five seconds, but it was to the North of that tree. And it and and that's where it was coming from. It was coming from that dead gum sentinel tree out there up on that ridge. That's that's wow. been there since I was a little boy, still there. So they're obviously still using it. And I'm thinking, well, welcome home, Kumbo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, a few days later, I'm out there and and uh and uh my brother in law, you know, he I'm right here where my sister and brother in law used to live. And he, you know, they get talking about how they used to come up here around the house at night and how they found tracks right out here in the backyard and stuff like that. So Joe is not real booger savvy. So I just don't let him uh, run loose very much at night. And at least I didn't when I first got here. And so uh, I uh, go out with him, let him out normally. And um, 
axle. I had let him out, or I, I'd gone out with him. I had a flashlight in my hand. Well, old Jake, he's got this ball that he totes around outside all the time, want me to throw it or kick it or something like that. And he was out there, you know, messing around with it. And all of a sudden, he stopped. And he, we've got this detached garage that's across the driveway, about fifty yards north of the house here. And um, he, uh, he was looking out there beside that garage, and he goes w- walking out there. And he gets within about about 20 yards of that house, that garage, and all of a sudden he dropped his ball, and that's his favorite outdoor toy. And uh, he dropped that ball, whirled around here. He came at a at a fast trot back back towards me, and he and he kept sort of glancing back, you know, and he went right past me and up on the porch he went. And um, I said, "Well, what's going on over there?" And I flipped my click my flashlight on and I've got a utility trailer that I, that I leave sitting over there. And I had eye shine looking back at me from back behind that utility trailer crouched down. And, um, and they were big old eyes too. And those suckers were about, I don't know, 10 inches apart, something like that. And I was about, I don't know, like I said, about 50 yards from them. And, um, didn't hear anything, and I got to looking, and I kept catching glimpses of other eye shine that was up about nine feet off the ground, back in the brush and stuff behind, back behind the garage, where we've got an old corral that we haven't used in so long. It's got a bunch of brush and privet hedges and crap growing up in it now, and but something was walking around back in there that was throwing mostly red eye shine, but. Um, the one that was crouched down behind the trailer moved around a little bit. It, you know, it sort of would go over here and it didn't get come back over here. And, and, uh, I sat out there and watched it for a good while. And, um, I even, uh, propped up on my fence corner on my fence, the porch corner post and braced my phone up there and took some pictures of it and got a couple of pretty good pictures. And, um, uh, Joe showed up and um, or something distracted me for a minute. And I turned around to, uh, I guess it was Joe coming back. I turned around to let him, let him up on the porch. And when I turned back around, um, the, um, it was gone. Yeah. Even when I shined my light out there and I caught a glimpse of the eye shine moving to the West over towards, we've got an old shed that, that we got a tractor and some implements and stuff back behind it. And it's just used for storage. I scanned around with my flashlight and I caught a, I caught another big eye shine just going around the West corner of that shed. And uh, so I had, um, I had a visitor that night or a couple of visitors, maybe even three. I thought I saw three sets of eye shine at different times and they've been back out there one time since then. So, uh, um, so they're still here, but this is about the time of the year though, that most of them start migrating back towards up town Creek, back towards uh bankhead national forest. So there's only just one small troop that, that, that I know of that stays out here all year. Um, but so, um, you know, I feel like I got an, a proper welcome and, <laughs> Back in October, me and uh, Pat Ranch and Jimmy Osmer and Cheryl Corntassel and Troy Allen and Greg Howes and uh, Jack Oberkirch and uh, Nathan Bolin, and I'm trying to think who I, Jack's son might have come too. I can't remember. But it was a gang of us camped out back there in the woods up on big point that overlooks the river. And uh, we got visited a, a couple of times while we were there and Joe got educated pretty well. He he got lured out to the camp with us screaming and yelling at him, and one of them belly crawled up close to the uh, close to where we were sitting there eating after dark, and and um, uh, Joe saw it and he took off chasing it. Well, we'd already we'd been we knew they were there. We'd been hearing them and stuff, and and uh. 
he took off chasing this one that was closest and uh, after it, and Joe was really fast. Well, there were two more out there that took off right in behind him. Like I said, they were trying to hem him up and had a little rodeo down there for a while. And me and Jimmy were running down through there, raising, yelling and screaming and raising hell. And Pat was yelling. And, and uh, it was, that, that's right. That's the first night we were here. So it's just the three of us out there. And um, they were trying to catch Joe. And I could hear him just running all around down there in the woods. And, and, um, and you could hear the, the, the boogers running like crazy. And finally I remembered, I think he didn't know what, which way to go. And I remembered I had my remote for my truck in my pocket and I snatched it out and mashed the horn button. Once the horn started blowing here, he came wide open as fast as he could go. And since then he, uh, he's been real good about not taking off in the woods, chasing boogers. Uh, he had a good opportunity down in Talladega national forest a couple of weeks ago. Uh, right before I ended up having to go in the hospital with my heart. And this was the week, at, a few days after the LBL trip. But uh, he, uh, we were sitting there in camp and we could hear, we could hear one right out just east of us a little ways and we were getting glimpses of it on thermal. And um, Joe was zeroed in on it and, and uh, Jake, knew it was there but jake was back up there with us he didn't want anything to do with it but all of a sudden joe went running towards the tree line barking and raising hell with his hackles all up and and he slammed on the brakes and stopped about six feet short of the tree line and so pat and i said it looks like he got educated a little bit out there on the farm <laughs> he didn't pile off there chasing them so uh, anyway so you got any, you guys got any questions anything You've heard me talk about you want me to expound on a little bit more? Well, your friend Spencer Jameson asked yes, a sir. great question. Uh -huh. And he asked, Why do you think the boogers have remained on your family's farm for so long? Any specific food source or just comfortable? You think they just stay all year round? Well, I'll answer the last question first. There's, there's at least one fairly small troop that's there year round. Uh, we see them off and on um, all year round, but during from about the middle of April, you know, from about now till mid October, most of the ones we see are adults. We don't see very many little ones. Um, from about the third week of October till about the, you know, about this time, about the second week of April, we have a lot more out here. They migrate into here from, from um, up in Bankhead National Forest. And they come down the Mud Creek and the Town Creek watershed and end up uh, scattered out up and down the river here. Um, and the reason, I think one of the reasons is there in Bankhead, there's not much agriculture or, or anything. And once the, once the uh, um, acorns are depleted, um, the pickings are relatively slim as far as, you know, they can nab a few coyotes and they can eat deer, but, you know, they like more variety. Well, they can come down here and... Along this river, when I, I mean, I remember from the time I was a little boy and I still find them, you'll find areas down in these hollers where you'll find a big pile of mussel shells. They eat, they eat freshwater mussels uh -huh. and you'll find usually up on tops of the ridges and stuff that, that are, that are out there near the, near the lake. Uh, you'll find at the base of a tree and you can, if you find it fresh enough, you can see where it's been sitting there leaned back against the tree where they, they disassemble fish and you'll find a pile that's got the, the um, scales and, and the skin and everything. And then next to it, there's usually another pile that's got, um, that's got the, uh, the bones and stuff in the head right there beside it. 
And then sometimes you'll find mussel shells, you know, a stack of mussel shells there too. So they like to, they like to fish um, a lot. As a matter of fact, you can get on um, any of these, many of the databases out there and look at sightings uh, in the counties along the Tennessee River. And there's a lot of those uh, sighting reports where the booger is seen, or the Bigfoot or whatever you want to call it, is seen out there in the water. And this is uh, in the, along the Tennessee River and up the up in the Elk River and such and some of the other tributaries where people see them out in the water. And they're not going out there just to, to uh, you know, to take a bath. They're, they're out there fishing and, uh, and looking for mussels and muskrats and stuff like that up under the banks and things. We got a lot of muskrats here. We got a surprising number of beavers. And uh, they'll, it, but they come down here during the winter and during and and the first part of the spring because of the diversity of food. And when they first get down here in October, there's a, you know, they can find where there's been corn planted. There's still corn laying around in the, in the fields that the, that the, um, uh, you know, corn pickers and stuff have missed and, you know, they'll find gardens and stuff like that. That are that still have some food in them, even though it's you know waste food by our def definition. It's you know they find this fine for them, but um, there's a and it could be um, uh, that you know it, it's incidentally around the first you know first week or two in October is when your when bow season starts up there in the bank head. So there's a lot more people in the, in the woods and then they stay around and then you then got deer seed, you know, the gun season starts. There's a lot more people in the woods. And then uh, along about in, in April, we have spring Turkey season. And after the, that there's, there's nobody there except hikers and campers and stuff. And until, around in October again. And well, you have a few squirrel hunters, but I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not, but there was a very wise gentleman that he did not consider himself a researcher at all, but I learned a lot from this guy. He was a rural mail carrier and um, he and his wife, both that, uh, that carried the mail out in a, uh, in East Colbert and West, Lawrence County. And he told me back in the seventies and I didn't believe him, but, uh, at the time, but now I do, he was the one that told me about the boogers migrating out of, out of Bankhead in October out to the area up and down the river here. And then migrating back to Bankhead in April. And the interesting thing that he told me was, that they brought their deer with them. That they that they herded deer with them when they came down here. And he oh. told me back in the 70s that one of these days we're, we would have a huntable population of deer on up and down the river here and on our farm because of the, the boogers bringing them out here. And I thought, eh, yeah. Well, that's one of those many, many things that that I learned later was the absolute truth. We do have a healthy population of deer out here and, and they're all up and down this area. And the interesting thing, the deer that were, that are in Bankhead were brought down here from Michigan and they rut the week before Thanksgiving, whereas the native Alabama deer rut in the first two weeks of January. You know, they, they start the week between Christmas and new years and, and it, and it rolls over into, uh, it's pretty much over by the 15th of January. And the deer here on our farm rut are Michigan deer. They rut in, um, in November, the week before wow. Thanksgiving. Yep. Wow. So, so he knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew, and, uh, this gentleman, he was very close to the, even though he was a mail carrier and, you know, everything, he was a, I don't know if he's full blooded, but he was a Choctaw Indian, and he he taught me many, many, many things. He he taught me about the females 
that their feet were were sort of bowed, you know, banana shaped or whatever. Uh-huh. He told me about that back in the nineteen seventies, and um, and I and I actually went out looking for tracks there in in some of the creek beds, and I found found them. I found the two different kinds of tracks, and and uh, and, and we've come to know that that's that that's the truth. I mean, he told me many things that I learned was the truth. Um, but um, that's, that was a, that's, I wish, I wish that I had appreciated the knowledge that he was trying to impart to me uh, back when he was doing it. Cause he knew that I was very, very interested in them. And I was always out there trying to learn more about them. But at, at the time, you know, I hadn't learned to listen to everybody. You can learn something from just about everybody. And there's no, That's nobody true. is, nobody is the one and only expert on anything concerning these, That's, these features. That's absolutely uh, yeah. true. Uh, I, I just you, want could to. You put, could you put, um, uh, I say Ruger Ridge. Could you put Spencer's um, question back up there? I didn't answer all of it. I'm sorry. Uh, I got We, probably have lost it once chat goes by for a few minutes oh, then, okay. then you can't scroll back up but i was okay. just going to tell ruger ridge that if you'll go yeah. back and listen at the beginning of the show that yeah. kumbo told a very creepy story that involved a little girl in in missouri yeah so go check missouri, that out on the missouri river yeah and, um, um I'll tell you, I'll tell you one that happened <laughs> in my backyard. <laughs> I had been out playing around and doing some calls and stuff. And, uh, and I accidentally called one right up on the back deck and scared oh. us half to death one night. This is when oh. I lived up there in Northern Missouri. Yeah. Yep. I bet the little woman had something to say about that. She was not happy. <laughs> she was not happy. <laughs> But uh, scared, scared, scared me half to death. And and uh, tell you one thing, a little Zara, our little female shepherd at the time, she didn't hesitate to go after that thing. Hmm. She about she and the other and the other dogs just about took the door. We had an atrium door that went out on the back deck, and it came up right in there and looked looked in the in the window in the through the door at us. It's, this is a, a glass door. And man, she went after it, and the other ones backed her up. They piled in, and I, I thought they were going to take the thing out of the plumb out of the wall of the house. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that that was pretty scary. And um, I had a a fella that uh, lived up in a little place called Shibley's Point. Missouri, which is near a, not far from a pretty good sized conservation area up there. And he came home from work one night and um, got out of his truck and caught some, if I remember this correctly, he caught some movement out of the corner of his eye and um, looked over there and there was a, there was a, a, a big one and a big type one uh, just walking through his yard. It'd been out there probably in his front yard when he drove up and he didn't see it, but it was just walking down beside his house and uh, the north side of his house and headed west and went off down into the woods. And uh, there was a little place uh, not too far from Novinger, Missouri, which we lived between Kirksville and Novinger. And I heard several reports about people going back into this one little area. Uh, I think they were going back in there fishing and ran up, ran, ran up on a, just a, a, a single sort of, everybody described it as sort of old and scruffy looking. And uh, I haven't heard any recent, any reports out of that guy in a number of years. So I think he was an old uh, alpha or something that, got old and got thrown out of his troop and he was just sort of a loner that lived down in this one area, but he was known to yell and scream and throw stuff at people. Wow. Uh, um, but, let's see. I, yeah, I want you to, 
comment on this. This is from our friend Scott Espinosa. And uh no, hey, Scott. And you've met Scott, and yeah, he would like to know: did you ever habituate on your property? Now I know the answer, but I think this is important for you well, to discuss this for a minute. Okay. Right here on the farm when I was a kid, well, even up when I was a teenager, whenever we planted a garden, we always, uh, we, we would plant a garden here and then we would go back to the, to around the, the fields on the back of the farm and we would plant, you know, squash and potatoes and peas and beans and, and watermelons and cantaloupe and, uh, musk melons and a lot of different things back back of the farm near the woods and you'd have to ask my grandmother I remember asking her as a kid you know why are we doing this you know why don't we plant all this we got all this stuff up here well this is for us stuff There was always some plum trees growing in the hedgerows back there on the, on the back of the farm. And back there, time to plant uh, apple trees and you want to stop for a minute, Larry? Yeah, you were breaking up really bad. It, well, your, audio, your audio was. It sounded like Mr. Ramato. Oh, oh, he fixed you. <laughs> there he is. There he ain't. There he is. Can you hear us? Okay, Kupo? can you hear me now? Yeah. We can. Okay. I might need to go over here and punch my router. And uh, uh I'm right sucking off you're the doing okay. I'm doing okay now. You're yep. doing okay, okay now. Okay. Well, I did. Did you hear me telling about the garden and the plum trees and the? Okay. Yes. Well, we always had stuff. We always had fruit trees and stuff in the hedgerows and back around the edges of the fields and stuff on the back of the farm. We always planted stuff back there. And but the purpose was so that they would leave our stuff alone. <laughs> oh <laughs> you can't take man! Water you know it. You can't. They can't even drink water. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> no. So now, so that was my. <laughs> Now, the only thing that we didn't have growing on the back of the farm that we had growing up here was figs. My grandmother had a bunch of fig bushes, fig trees growing out around the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Get that natural oh. fertilizer, you know. <laughs> That's where the seed come from. <laughs> <laughs> You're a fan of fig newton, huh? <laughs> I didn't used to eat a lot of those things, but, but anyway, so anyway, all, she had all her fig trees and she used to make fig preserves all the time. And we were out here and, and, uh, I was about eight, nine years old. I'd been out here helping her with something. And this was in late summer when the figs were, were, were bearing, you know, we're getting ripe and, and we'd, we'd stop for lunch and I was sitting there in the, at the, at the table there in the kitchen, just finished my lunch and I don't know what I was doing. Sure wasn't playing with a cell phone, I can tell you that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, and she, and Granny was at the sink washing dishes, and all of a sudden she says, "Dad, gum it!" And she goes running out there, running and grabs a broom out from behind the door, busts out the kitchen door, and goes. And I get up, what's going on? I get up, I look out, and she's running out the, running out the, uh, uh, across the yard. With that broom up overhead, swinging that broom, you know, you get out of here, get, get. And she runs up, she runs up to the outhouse, 
whop, whop. She starts hitting that outhouse with a broom. And uh, and right as just before she got there, I see a big old arm come around that outhouse and reach out there and Ooh. grab a fig and yank it back. And she she sat there and she was screaming, hollering, and beating on that outhouse. And the booger just <laughs> right around the corner on the back side of it. And then just a minute, I get a glimpse. Here he goes, you know, off down through there. <laughs> right over he's and he was big enough. We had a three our fence around the yard back then was three foot hog wire with two or three strands of bob wire on top of that. And this yeah. dude didn't even break stride. He went over that fence like it wasn't even there, like you and I'd step over a curb. And uh <laughs> and off down between the barns he went. And she was yelling at him, Don't you come back here, you know. We always used to laugh that they modeled Granny Clampett after my Granny Baker. <laughs> Man, she wasn't scared of anything. Well, hell, she lived out here by herself for decades, you know, for for ages, and uh, yeah. it didn't bother her. But she knew exactly what was out here, and it didn't bother her, you know. But uh, <laughs> like I said, she chased one off with a dead gum broom. <laughs> <laughs> out there, you know, I was half wondering if she was going to run around there and whop it over, whop him upside the head with that broom, but she just went out there beating on the outhouse and <laughs> with uh, <laughs> with it. But, uh, but now, fast forward a few years, and and I'm uh, back in the late nineties. I was living down in northeast Mississippi, down there in Wamba County. And, um, uh, I've gone away again. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, we can still hear can you. Can y'all hear me? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, all right. Now, I was living down in Itawamba County out uh, near a little old place. Um, is in between New Site and, and uh, Bailey Springs, Bay Springs Place, and, uh, uh, off of Highway 4 down there. And had boogers there all the time. Every time I came out, uh, getting ready to go to work or something, I'd hear a little bird, funny bird call or a whistle or something right behind my house in the tree line. Had pines planted around. And then there would always be an answer, usually a hop off down in the bayou there west of the house. And um, um, and then there was a big old bayou down there that was fed by a couple of big blue water springs. But um, uh Anyhow, and then when I'd come home from work, as soon as I'd pull up and get out of the truck, I'd hear a whistle or a, or a little whoop or some something, and then again, a, a, usually an answering knock down there in the in the bottom. And so, occasionally, I would uh, leave you know something out on the on the front porch, and it would get gone during the night. Well, uh, we had a big uh, corporate. I worked in Boonville then, and we had a big corporate meeting where people came in from that they decided to have it at our plant because we'd done a whole bunch of work to, to a bunch of new equipment and improvements and everything. So they were going to sort of show it off. So they had this big corporate meeting where people came in from our plants all around the country to our plant. We had a big, uh, the last day we had a, a big sort of a lunch meeting and they served us a bunch of subway sandwiches and they brought them in in big old round trays metal trays the sandwiches were cut in thirds and piled up on this on these trays well when it was all over with they had about 30 something of these sandwiches left so me being the single guy they gave gave me this big platter with all of them stacked up in there on a big pyramid i ate off of them for a couple of days and you know sandwiches get soggy after a few days so I decided I'm just going to set them out on the porch tonight. I don't want to eat any more of these things. So I did. Came out the next morning, and there were all the sandwiches were gone. Every one of them. And there was a sitting there beside the, the platter was a nice uh, stack of tomatoes stacked all up. I mean, stack of tomatoes about that high, about like this high. And beside that, stack of onions. So that particular booger or boogers, they didn't like maters. They didn't like sliced maters and they didn't like onions. But laying there on the tray was a, and I've got it around here 
somewhere. I wish I could go find it and show it to you. But I've, I've got a flat, round, white rock about that big around. It's about that thick. And smooth rock that was laying there in the tray. And I had heard that was one of the things that mail carrier told me that they would do is that that they would, you know, they'd give you gifts, but sometimes they'd give you these flat, these round, flat, smooth white rocks. And that was the first one that I'd ever ever got. I got later on, uh, I got another one down there later on from this same group. But the weird thing was sitting there beside the platter, the, the metal platter or tray, there was a dog skull. And it was just as clean. It was obviously had been put in a, in an ant on a, on an ant pile for a while, because it was just clean, white, no, no, uh, you know, no nothing, flesh or anything or hair or anything left on it. It didn't stink or anything. And I picked it up and got to looking at it, and all of a sudden I said, "Holy crap!" or something to that effect. And uh. The right upper canine was broken off at a weird angle. And I instantly knew that there was, it was my neighbor's old, uh, it was my neighbor's lab, Yeller, that had disappeared a couple of years previous to this. That was his skull. And um, I had a bobcat skull left out here at the farm one time when I was a kid and we, we, we put some stuff out and I don't remember what it was that we put a bunch of it out, but I came back later and I found a clean bobcat skull. And this is when I was a boy. Um, but I found that dog skull. So I called my neighbor up, Matt. And, uh, I said, you got to come over here and see this. And, uh, he, uh, he never would let his dogs in his house. He always made them stay outside overnight and he kept losing them. He's, he did his dogs didn't last any time there. And I kept telling him. And, uh, so he came over and I said, look at that skull right there. And, uh, he did, he picked it up. I said, look at it closely. And all of a sudden I just saw the color drain out of his face. And he says, uh, that's he was holding it. He says, "That's Yeller skull," and I said, yeah, "It is. It certainly is." And I said, "That's proof to you they got him." <laughs> and uh, so they they had brought his skull back and left it there as a thank you for me giving them those sandwiches. Hmm. And uh, he took the skull with him, and I and he never got another dog after that. That I. In fact, he had lost another dog after he'd lost Yeller. And after that dog, in fact, I think he'd just lost that other, this, the next dog. He never got another one after that, that I knew of. You know, I moved away from there a year or so later, and, and uh, he never had replaced that dog. But um, had that incident and another one where he – Wanted to know. He couldn't believe that they stayed that close and watched us like that. And so I thought I'd prove it to him. So uh, I don't know if I ought to reveal this or not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just say that, uh, that I got something that I knew they would like. And um, I said, let's go. You can see from his kitchen window, you can see his well house right there in the backyard. And his well house is not very far from the tree line. And this being a fairly young pan pine plantation, there were a lot of weeds and briars and stuff grown up back behind that well house. But there was just enough space behind the well house that he could get by there with his with his Kubota tractor, which I think had a either a five foot or a six foot more deck on it. So the, the back of the well house was either five feet or six feet away from the, the edge of the cutover tree line there. And so I got this particular um, 
food item that I knew, know that they really, really like. And I carried it down there and, uh, and put it on his well house. And this thing's juicy. And uh, when you set it down on something, juice runs out of it. And, uh, or a, let's just say a liquid runs out of it. And so, and I told him, I said, if there's any around here, I said, we'll be able to sit there in your kitchen and watch it. They will come absolutely positively. So he walked up there to his kitchen and went in there and, um, he goes up to the window and looks out. And he says, well, I think it slid off. Well, the well house top was, had just barely enough slope on it that the rain would run off of it. And I said, no, it couldn't have slid off. He said, it was not there. And he had some of not binoculars there sitting on the windowsill. So he picked them up and he looked down there and it's gone. Okay. So I said, well, maybe it did slide off. So, down the hill we go and we get there and you could clearly see in the juice where something had reached up there and scraped it off, pulled it off the well house. And there was a little bit of the stuff laying on the, laying on the ground right there. And the grass was freshly tromped down and there was a hole through the pretty wide hole through the briars and the Johnson grass and, and crap there. So, uh, anyway, uh, so that pretty much made a believer out of him. And it surprised me that they came as fast as they did. And, uh, I don't really, uh, Leanne 72 says, what is it? I don't really want to, uh, tell what it is because I don't want people using this stuff for the wrong thing. But, uh, but, uh, uh, there are a few items out there that, that they really, really like. And, uh, but it is that, not KY jelly, Larry. It's not one about coconut oil. It may be coconut oil now. <laughs> <laughs> no, not coconut oil. <laughs> uh, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what though, you could, uh, I guess maybe a shower curtain in a, couple of containers of this you could probably have some fun you know <laughs> i don't know it'd be a little it'd be messy <laughs> i i know why and, and you really and you, re, you wouldn't, really wouldn't smell very good afterwards either <laughs> i know um, i've been missing a lot of questions yeah, uh, yeah. but but uh your friend spencer jameson really yeah ask a great question and he asked what all the places that you've researched is there any common denominators you've noticed anything that you can discuss publicly yeah there, there's one? a few well for one thing i have found boogers in places as diverse as the the deserts of of um California, Eglin Air Force, I mean, excuse me, Edwards Air Force Base, for instance, out in New Mexico, in uh, right there in the, uh, what do they call that, the uh, the basin where White Sands is, the, uh, uh, not Carrizozo, let's see, the Tularosa Basin, which is, which is, you know, pretty close to desert. You know, I found boogers places from there all the way up to the, the absolutely, you know, unbelievably lush forest lands of, of, uh, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, you know, Georgia, uh, Kentucky, Louisiana, places like that. So, but the common denial, and I found them out in, uh, they're up in Northern New Mexico, up in the ship rock Farmington area. The common denominators are they've got to have a year round water source. And now, that said, I have found them in a couple of places where in the desert areas where they irrigate year round. And I have found them being able to eke and get enough water out of these irrigation wells and stuff and these irrigation ditches that they'll stay there. 
uh, especially with these irrigation ditches. But um, they've got to have a year-round water source. They've got to have cover uh, and a place that they can get out of the weather somewhat. And it could just be a rock ledge or down in a, in a deep holler or ravine or a cave or something. And they, they've got to have some kind of uh, plants that, are, that, that they can eat because they're not pure. They're omnivores like we are. They're not pure carnivores. Um, so they've got to have, um, you know, some edible plants that they can get to a good part of the year. But, you know, even right here, they don't eat anything plant-based very much at all from around October to, um, October, early November till on up, it'll be on up in May before they get much anything that's plant-based. Uh, that's edible. Their 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 diet is seasonal um, in this part of the country, in a large part of the United States. Uh, they'll eat a lot of plant based proteins and such during the late spring, through the summer, and into the early fall. And then it goes, it switches over to more and more protein based. And you see that in the deer kills and and the calf kills and stuff that we find in the uh, through the summer through the late spring and through the summer and into the early fall when they when they kill a deer or a calf or dog or whatever they'll usually get the first thing they get is the uh, the liver and the kidneys and the heart and very often also the lungs. And occasionally they'll tear out the inside tenderloins, the inside loins that are along the either side of the the uh, the spinal uh, inside spinal processes or or their their backbone uh, in the upper part of their lower abdomen, um, right up above the liver and all that. And then sometimes they'll tear out the uh, the tongue. And sometimes they'll pop the top of the head off and and eat the brains. Um, and generally, when they when they kill an animal, they when they open up the the abdominal cavity, they tear the skin right along the lat the back of the last rib, and so that they just have to reach inside. They lay they'll lay the animal down on one laying on one side or the other. And on the upper, which, whichever side of the rib cage is up, they'll tear the skin down along the back side of that rib cage. And then they'll reach inside. And right inside is the back edge of the diaphragm. And even though their fingernails on a Bigfoot are not real sharp, they've got immense strength and those nails are tough. And they'll, they'll use their fingernail and they'll slit that diaphragm open along that um, along the, the inside of the rib cage. And then they, they reach inside. They make a big enough slit that they can reach inside and they get a hold of the heart and they tear out the heart. And what that does is that allows the blood to drain into the upper thoracic cavity. And it and it fills up the heart lung cavity. And because they've the deer, whatever it is, is laying on its side and they do this right at the top of the rib cage, the blood fills up in there, but it doesn't run out. And they will actually let that blood sit in there till it starts co coagulating. And they'll reach in there and they'll scoop that co coagulated blood out along with lung material and eat it like it's a, a bread pudding or something. And that's the first thing they do when they when they're taking their time when they've killed a large animal. Then they come back and that's when they pull out the uh, the kidney and the the kidneys and the liver and the other things out of the lower abdominal cavity or the rear abdominal cavity. And they typically do not eat the entrails unless they're pretty bad off, unless they're you know having a shortage. And they'll generally pull the entrails out and 
most of the ones I've seen that where the animal hasn't been moved since it was killed and fed on. The entrails will be laying near one of the back, you know, near the back legs. And the also, if you look at the back legs, one or both of them have been twisted and broken, the lower parts of the back legs. And that's because they, they catch them there. They very often catch them by the back legs and they'll slam them against a tree or slam them on the ground or something like that. But at least with deer, they're very often done like that. Now with hogs, there are a lot of eyewitness accounts that they just come out on when they, when they ambush a hog, they just come out and give it a big old boom, big alley oop, uh, smash and knock it out. You know, they, they hit it with their fist. You come down on it hard overhand like that and stun it. Now, uh, back to, so back to, uh, Spencer's question, common denominators. You got to have an all an, a year round water source. You got to have some kind of large game in the area for them to feed on during the winter and you know late summer. I mean, late fall through the winter and into early spring. You got to have some kind of plant protein that grows there that's edible to them, probably kill us um, during the uh, late spring through the summer and into the early fall. You got to have some kind of cover where they can get out of the sun, get out of the weather a little bit when they need to. And you've also got to have cover where they can raise their families, where they can, where their, where their females can have their young and in an isolated place that's not easily found. Now, this can be something as simple as a shelter belt along a river, like many rivers out west. And um, I found them in a very desolate area of the of uh, southeastern Colorado in 2019, uh, no, 2020, um, out there um, near an irrigation lake where a, a county had, uh, farmers in a county had gotten together and built this big artificial lake out there. And it was the only large water source for miles around. And there's boogers that live around it. And, uh, uh, I know we went in there, we were on a motorcycle ride and it was a free place to camp because there was a boat ramp there and a, and a little vault toilet nearby. So, uh, we went in there to camp and I was looking around and one of the guys that rides that I ride with, it's this Bigfoot savvy. He said, you reckon there's any Bigfoot in here? And about that time we heard across the lake. And he said, well, I guess there are. And I said, yeah. <laughs> you, and, well, you think they stay over there? And I says, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I don't think you're going to bother us, but uh, you hurt us or anything like that. And he said, well, I'm sleeping in my sleeping bag. And I said, well, me too. And we did. Only thing came around us that night was some coyotes. Well, we heard a number of good vocalizations that night. But, uh, but this is in the middle of nowhere in the desert of, of uh out in southeastern Colorado, but um, but those are some of the common denominators. Now, to the degree that you have these items, and every one of these go quality of the habitat, and uh, I rate habitat all over the country, and and sort of uh, based on I've come up with some formulas. <laughs> Come out, I say boogers per square mile, I say boogers per square foot, you know, point zero 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 three eight five boogers per square foot or something like that. You know, I don't know. You know I, I've had some fun with it, but uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the last and I, I do my population estimates using uh, some software that the Audubon Society and the Department of Interior uses for detecting and not counting the presence of rare animals. And the, uh, the software is, uh, it's called presence. I don't know if it's the latest and greatest thing, but they used it for years and I, and I use it too. And, um, based on that, the last time I ran a very exhaustive, uh, study of the, the population and I went back and looked at my notes from all over the country. And I've, I've been on the ground, on the ground in the boonies, you know, researching these things in 43 out of 50 states. The states I haven't been in, 
or Hawaii, Alaska, um, Idaho, Oregon, uh, Michigan, uh, Connecticut, and believe it or not, South Carolina. Wow. I don't, know, I don't know how in the world I've missed South Carolina, but Tevin <laughs> Rowland, you better be ready. I'm coming out there, buddy, and we're going to go beat the bushes. <laughs> he's a gentleman, and he's a gentleman in South Carolina that I've been uh, communicating with for a number of years, and he's found some great stuff out there. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, but anyway, I've. I've there's a 300 square mile area of Northeast Mississippi. That's my reference area that I've kept track of the, uh, the different troops of Bigfoot in, in that, in that area for decades. And I judge all other habitat in this, in the country based on, in fact, even in, in foreign countries that I've been in research in which that number's nine, um, uh, that, uh, and the only other place out of the United States I've found any evidence, hard evidence at all, was Canada. But anyhow, uh, that's my reference. And I compare every other bit of habitat that I've been in and in, in, in around the country to that area. And I come up with factors, you know, uh, multipliers and stuff that I use. Um, to so I can calculate the populations and I've I've run up the numbers of square miles in every state I've divvied the states up into regions and stuff and of you know different ratings of of the habitat and the last time I ran it really exhaustively using very very conservative numbers I came up with at least in um the uh in just in the United States and I was just gee whizzing, doing a swag for Alaska, but I came up that we got at least sixty-five thousand around the country. Probably, wow. probably, the way the population is in, increasing, it's probably closer to a hundred thousand, and it may be more than that. I don't know, but we got at least sixty-five thousand, and I would, and, I, and my gut tells me it's more like a hundred thousand. Now, a lot of people call me crazy. You can throw rocks at me, whatever you want. But hey, you know, one of these days I'm gonna publish this, and you can run it, run it yourself, and and see where I get it. But uh, but I've, you know, well, you really, you, can't, know. you really can't, you know, there there's not many people around this country that have been so as many places as I have seriously looking for these things. And I'm not bragging. I worked for the government for years, and buddy, as long as I was traveling on Uncle Sam's nickel, he owned me from from eight to five. Rest of the time was mine, and I yeah. and I put that time to good use. <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, I I agree with you because just yeah. my gut feeling says there would have to be that kind of population yeah. to keep the gene pool pure. Correct, and uh, but uh, look, we. We got a question. I know I'm missing a lot of questions, but I think uh, I think that you might be able to elaborate on this. And Gene asked, "Kumbo, have you heard of any sightings in Blount, Blount County, County. Al Alabama? There ain't no boogers in Blount County. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's boogers in Blount County. Yes, yeah, there's." Uh, I can't recall any. I think that might be down in the in the area where the Alabama white thing hangs out, or no, nah, I think white things more north north of there. But yeah, I've heard quite a few uh, sighting reports down there. In fact, there's a fine gentleman that has a Blunt County Bigfoot organization. Let me see what his name is. I'll pull him up. I'm a member of that group, and uh, I me can't. Too. Yeah, now what's his name? He's Don't sharp. put me on the spot. Well, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me let me pull him up here. Hang on just a minute. And uh hang 
Hang on just a minute. Here we go. Facebook. Got it. Kumbo. Do what? As, as soon as I see it, I'll know it. No, I don't need friends. Yeah, me too. Let me see here. Group. Come on. Oh, I ain't believing this. Yeah. Brandon Lee Moore. That's right. Brandon Moore. He is, uh, let me see what the name of that group is. Uh, hang on just a second. And he's a good researcher. Groups. Blount County Bigfoot uh-huh. Research Organization of Alabama. Yeah, that's there it. There you go. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yep. Uh, He's been busy working lately, though. Yeah, he, he started, has started his own business. And we've been trying to get we've been trying to get together, and we can't ever get our schedules. Uh, uh, yeah, Blunt County Bigfoot Research Organization, man, a BCBRO. But yeah, he is uh, that group there. You can get on their website and probably find out a lot more than you can find out a whole lot more about what's going on with boogers in Blunt County than that I can come up with off the top of my head. But uh, but yeah, there's a there, there, are, there are definitely boogers in Blunt County, Alabama. And uh, one of them's got uh, Moog's used car sales down there. Uh, and <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, yeah. Oh, oh, what about okay, oh, what so I, the question? We got 35 more questions. Yeah. Okay. Now, what but, was the moment I was most afraid? Well... There's a place down the north end of uh, Holly Springs National Forest that my I've been in a couple of times. I'm only near thirty the miles old from cemetery there. Down here. In fact, in fact, it's in fact it's uh, Cam Buckner. You ain't a hair on your butt if you don't go out there because I've told you where it is. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 but uh, it's not too very far from where, where Dick's encrypted lives. And that place is, I've never been able to get anybody. Uh, I'm the only one that's had enough guts to even get out of the truck down there at this place. And, and I wasn't out there very long. I've never been able to get anybody that I've taken down there to get, get them to get out of the truck when we pull up. After really? we pull up the park. After dark. What kind of people are you yeah, really, around with? Really. Smart ones, I guess. Smarter than me. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm never me too, That's I'd get out. I, Yeah, I well, yeah, I know you would. <laughs> You're crazy as I am. But uh, <laughs> but I've never been down there more than with a couple of three people at a time. But um, you yeah. know, so one of these days we need to go down there about 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 four of us, and I think we could probably, you know, better experienced researchers, we could give it a fair shot. That place. I I, I want to uh, take think, Jimmy with us. I want to <laughs> take Jimmy with us. And you know, Sam. Jimmy Osmer. Sam's going. Yeah. Through. Yeah. Yeah. We need to take him out there. You know, I can outrun him. I think. So. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can I too. Be too worried. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hey, we need to take we need to take Bubba Gump down there with us, Jim Hart. I can outrun his ass now. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bubba, a shout out to you, buddy. And uh, yeah. hey, I know who we need to take down there because if they come out and give us any trouble, he'll whoop their hit. He, he's the only person I know that have a, that would have an even pretty good chance of whooping a booger's butt. That, that's Wade Parker down in Texas. Oh, I, yeah. I like yeah. old Wade. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I, think, I think yeah. Wade could handle <laughs> Are you going to say it or am I going to say it? If, if, if he know. can't whoop him, he'll bring that chloroform out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, that one stepped on him. He's down there in LBL on his honeymoon, and that came, one came down there and stepped on him when he's in his yeah. tent, and he yeah. lived to tell it. <laughs> so, yeah. And I'll tell you what, he's a. He's a he's a booger magnet. I'm telling you what we had a last time I was down in Oklahoma. You know, with Wade, uh, we had we had a couple of wild times down there, and uh, we had uh, somebody push down the General Sir Sherman Sequoia right there next to us. That's the largest <laughs> largest tree crash I've ever heard. 
But uh, huh. but let's see. AP Road was definitely a scary place the first few times we went in there, especially when Sammy uh, Sammy Armstrong and I went in there, and the, the boogers came out right in our face, three of them in the daylight. I didn't know if we were going to make it out of there. That that scared the bejeebers out of both of us. But, you know, I think if we hadn't had uh, riot guns in our hands, I, I don't know what would have happened because they, they busted right out of that brush right there in front of us. I mean, 30 yards away. And huh. they were mad. And, uh, and we were sitting there backed up against the front of my truck. Uh, leaned up, you know, backed up against the brush guard on the front of my truck, and we had our had the shotguns pointed at them and loaded up with slugs and double out buck, and uh, had our fingers on the triggers and the safety off. It was a, it was, it was as tense a moment as as, as I've ever had, you know, face to face with a booger, and they were yelling and carrying on. They finally, they sort of, one of them huffed sort of in disgust and turned around. They went walking back up into the brush and and they didn't go very far. We knew they were still there. And sure enough, when we went to leave, we had to go right back. There was only one way in and one way out of there. And we had to go right back past us and they, they started chasing us. And I had gotten ahead of them. I, I, I romped it and uh, I kept going so fast up the hill that when I got to the top, I was afraid that I was going to, my truck was going to jump over, plumb over the road and land in the ditch on the other side. And I had to nail the brakes, cut real hard to the right. And just, just as I was getting up on the pavement, they caught up with us and they busted out of the, out of the brush and they were running quadrupedally. And I didn't start gaining any ground on them until I got up around 50 miles an hour. And, um, uh, they were running. I mean, I was up 60, 65 getting away from them. Um, though they were, they were, they were making a pretty close to 50 miles an hour chasing us for a ways. Hmm. But, uh, that was scary. And the very first time I went down there by myself, uh, that was pretty scary when I didn't know that they would come to you during the day, a day then. And, uh, and that's when he, threw the big stick at it at me and put a big dent in the side of my truck that I hadn't even made the first payment on. I had to pay $700 to dent doctors in Tupelo to get the, to get the dent sucked out. But, uh, uh, I was on the back of my farm when I was, this would have been in about 78 fall of 78. I was squirrel hunting and, uh, decided to lay down on some, carpet moss that green carpet moss back there on the rim of one of the bluffs and uh over the river and take a nap it's beautiful about 10 o'clock sunny lay there was asleep and i woke up about 30 45 minutes later and i knew something was watching me i knew not to just pop my my eyes open and sit up so i cracked my eyes open and there was a female standing there in some, in some laurel bushes about six feet away from me. And I could clearly see her from um, the upper part of her chest up. You know, I could, I could see her, her breasts and, you know, her shoulders clearly and her, uh, and her face clearly. And she was standing, standing there and she was just looking at me. And her face was totally 100% expressionless. I couldn't tell if she was mad, glad, sad, angry, happy. I mean, her face was totally, totally emotionless when she was looking at me. And we sat there and looked at each other for a couple of three, eh, maybe a minute and a half, possibly two minutes. And then she just turned her head and walked off down the side of the hill and that's when I got the most scared because after she walked off I felt like my life was in serious danger because she was a mature female and I really felt that her mate was there that the alpha male was there and I was exceedingly scared 
to um, just get up. And that was one of the first times, if not the first time I ever talked to him. And I had a 22 rifle laying here by my side. And I really didn't know whether I ought to just flip over and off the bluff. The bluff's only about 40 feet high there. And I used to commonly jump off some of them that were 60 feet high as a kid. And so it didn't scare me to jump off into the river. And um, uh, I thought about, I thought seriously about doing that, but then I'd have had to swim for two or 300 yards to get to a place where I could get up out of the, uh, get up on dry ground, you know, get up where I could get up out of the water. And then it would, I would have had to walk a mile or so with being soaking wet. And that didn't appeal to me. So I just, I just said, uh, said, I'm sorry. I'm back here. I'm sorry. I'm in your, in your, uh, in your territory. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want you to hurt me. I've got a gun. I'm going to keep it pointed to the ground. I'm not going to, shoot at anything else back here. If you'll let me get up and, and leave and won't hurt me, I'll get out of here as fast as I can. I'll, I'll walk out of here the fastest way. And that's what I did. And, um, and when I got up, I mean, I truly felt like I was in danger and that I was being watched and the woods were dead quiet. And I went about a, by the time I'd gone about a hundred yards I was feeling better, but I still, I kept my head down and I kept the rifle. I was carrying the rifle with it pointed at the ground. And, uh, uh, and after about 150 yards, I felt safe, but I still, I did what I said I was going to do. I got the heck out of Dodge and I didn't go back over there for decades in that part of the farm. So, uh, that's, those are the ones that just come to me off the top of my head, but there's other times, but. Uh, shoot me another question. <laughs> uh, let's see. We're almost out of time, but Cole Holbrook asked, "Have you? Do you have any stories from Utah?" Uh nothing that I have personally seen. However. Um, I talked to a gentleman that was, uh, that worked at Arches and, um, Capitol Reef. And there is another park near there in the eastern, southeastern part of Utah. Let me see. North of, north of, um. Monument Valley, north of the Four Corners area. Um, let me see. There's Arches, and there's Capitol Reef, and there's a third national park right in there. Anyway, this gentleman had worked in there as a ranger uh, for a number of years, and he told me about... Um, uh, some areas where the Navajo had said that they had, I forget what their word for them was, but they had had encounters with them. And he said there was this one particular Canyon, Canyon land, arches and Canyon land and capital reef. And I can't remember which one is the, one of them is the furthest South and East and it's the next one north of that. I think it may be Canyon Lands. But there's a canyon, there's a canyon down there that um, that there was a, an actual a guy ranched down in there for decades, and it had been in his family actually probably for a uh, hundred years or so. But somehow they each got a living down in this canyon but that they used to see them down in there on a fairly regular basis because the only uh, right in there that the, they had an all weather, either Creek or small river that went through there. And that was the only um, year round flowing water that, uh, that was in the area and that they used to uh, encounter them 
on a semi-regular basis down in there. But so my reports are from from those three areas. But uh, he said this this former ranger said that uh, that they were all through those those uh, national parks and everything and they're just but they're because of the the sparseness of the habitat that there weren't very many of them. That's what I found out at Eglin Air Force. I mean Edwards Air Force Base in California as well. Um, that there were very few of them, but um, but there were some. So that's what I know about Utah. Now, I would suppose that in some of the more lush areas, um, uh, I've been over around Wendover a number of times, and I never, I never ran into anybody that talked anything about Bigfoot or anything. And I talked to some folks out there that would have known, and uh. And the bombing range out north of Wendover, I can't remember the name of it. I've talked to some people out around there. They never, never, never hear anything. Not to say that there's not a few there, but uh, but that's uh, those are about the only places in Utah that I've been very much. And I've been around in quite a bit in Grand Staircase Escalante. It's where I broke my leg back in 2020 and <laughs> rode my rode patched myself up. And, <laughs> rode 180 more miles that day with a broken leg and five days after that <laughs> got back that's, in. The, that's a story within itself uh, now, yeah. we got we got time for one last question yeah. Yeah. and uh it's from crow creek and i think everybody will be interested in this answer what's the and, largest you have seen in the area Largest ones I have seen right around in Bankhead, Colbert County, Lawrence County, Winston, Franklin, um, Coleman, West Morgan, or I've seen some 10 foot type ones are the largest ones I've seen. And, uh, and, but huge wide across the shoulders. Uh, we're talking about four foot plus across the shoulders Ooh. and probably thousand pounds plus on the foot, on the hoof, you know, you know, I mean, well, let me tell you the alpha that was out here on our farm for years, uh, his tracks, when I found them, they were 22 inches long. The one that's here now, uh, you heard me tell the story uh, at the, near the beginning of the show of when I first moved out here, seeing the ones over by the garage. I went back there the next day looking for tracks. I found a 19 and a half inch track that was uh, that was over. I've got pictures of it. I'm, and uh, that that uh, and I think it was over 10 inches wide across the ball of the foot. Yeah, found three of uh. them. And unfortunately. They were out here running the tractor, spraying the wheat, spraying fertilizer on the wheat, and ran over two of them. <laughs> <laughs> messed them up so I couldn't measure them. But the one that was that they that they didn't get, um, I uh, I measured it and it's 19 and a half inches long. Yeah, big big male track. So uh, I don't know if he's fully grown yet or not. I don't know, you know. But uh, that's that's all I have found so far. I've only been out here since the middle of March and, and I've just found those three tracks so far, but so I know we got 10 footers around here and I know there's 10 footers in, in Bankhead. Uh, wow. Give me another. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, we, we got to uh, put Larry to bed <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, but, yeah. Kubo, we just would like to give you this opportunity to leave our audience with anything that you want to leave them with. All right. Uh, well, let me think. Uh, well, <laughs> he sort of put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I will tell you that, uh, that, uh, 
Everybody's always asking asking me about um, thermal imagers. One thing's for sure: there's some brands out there that, in the price range three thousand and below, ab absolutely. Uh, uh, well, eh, let's say, let's say twenty five hundred dollars and below. That especially the lower you get, that they are they outperform the the FLIR brand tremendously. Uh, I've seen uh, ATIs and ATNs that are that are in the range of um, I don't know if I've seen ATIs that cheap, but I've seen some ATNs that were um, down less than five hundred dollars that just absolutely smoked uh, my six hundred dollar FLIR um, TK Scout mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, that's that's one thing people are always always asking me about it, and um, big thing is just get out there and be safe. Uh, always remember what I've always said about when you park, when you go in the when you're out there in the boonies, even if you're parking in, a, in an open field, turn your vehicle around and, and or make sure that vehicle is pointing in the safe way out so if something happens and it could be something as simple as running into a pack of wild dogs or a pack of a rabid coyote or something or a pissed off bear you need to be able to jump run and jump in that vehicle crank it up and throw it in gear and floorboard it and you're pointed in the safe way out and you're not having to do a bunch of juking and turning around uh that's my dad taught me that when i was a real little kid and that's come in very, very, very handy. And I've had some not good things happen a couple of times when I didn't remember and pay attention <laughs> to that. Uh, but uh, uh, let me see what else. If you're out on a riverbank or a causeway or something like that and you're calling them, don't think that because you're out there in the, and you're surrounded by water that you're all safe. They can swim a couple of hundred yards underwater without without coming up for a breath. Ooh. And uh, if you're if you're standing on the edge of a causeway or something and you've got a couple of three feet of water right there next to you, if you got a bad one that he wants to, that sucker can swim right up and snatch you off quicker than you can say, "Golly gosh." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we found ourselves in a situation like that in in Oklahoma a couple of years ago, and when we realized how finally sank in on us, how vulnerable we were, we got out of there, and we got out of there with rocks being thrown at us. And uh, but um, well, they weren't throwing them right at us; they were just trying to scare us out of there. And uh, but. Um, I still think that in most cases, having a good, strong flashlight with you is more effective than having a weapon. Yeah. I Shooting agree. one is the absolute last resort because if there's one there, there's three or four more there that you don't see nor hear. And always be, when you're out there, always have situational awareness. Be aware of what's going on around with, around you. If there's only two or three of you and you've and you've parked your vehicle and in a safe place, even with it pointed out, don't just go up there and stand on the, the y'all stand there together on one side of the truck or and be calling or listening or whatever. You need to be want, moving around that vehicle and watching what's going on around you, watching and listening. Because I've had them, we've made that mistake before and had them crawl right up under our truck. And we were on an outing down in Mississippi one time where we had about five or six truckloads of people. And one guy insisted on parking off by himself and away from the rest of our trucks for some reason. And we told him when we got ready to leave, I said, you need to go down there and shine all around that truck and shine underneath that truck. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he didn't. His wife went to get in the truck and there was one underneath. It was a juvie about a six and a half, seven foot tall one. 
but they are way stronger pound for pound than us. They're probably quadruple or more of our strength pound for pound. It reached out from as she was trying to get in the truck. It reached out and grabbed her by the ankle. You talk oh. about a rodeo. There was a Whoa. damn rodeo that went on there for about 10, 15 seconds. Whoa. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was something else. And it scared her so bad that that couple was divorced within a week or two after that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Serious. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you need to, you need to be aware. Uh, Scott Hayes and I were down in a really bad place up in Iowa on the, uh, right on the Des Moines river where it turned out to be a pretty active area. It was just the two of us. And, uh, we were constantly, and we were in a place where we could be sneaked up on real easy. And we were constantly moving around that truck on opposite sides of the truck, moving around to make sure that they didn't get in there on us, belly crawl up on us. Because the, this belly crawling that y'all, you guys have heard us talking about where they get up on their toes and fingers and yeah. their, their belly is only like an inch or two off the ground. You, until you see them do that, you cannot believe the ground they can cover doing that. And it looks like something out of a, a, a sci-fi horror movie. I mean, it, it gives me the damn creeps. <laughs> and they and you talk and they, they follow the nap of the earth doing it. And the thing and about you it, you can't can outrun turn, them. No, you can't outrun them. And they can they can be going in a direction. Still stay in that perfect direction and turn sideways, still moving in that direction, looking back at you or looking at you. And you think that doesn't look creepy? Oh. It does. And hell, I've seen them, uh, Troy Allen and uh, Eddie Moreland and myself got one down at LBL doing that. At um, I can't remember the name of that boat ramp, but uh, and it took off. I put a light on it and it dropped to its belly and took off getting it scooting away from us like that. Hmm. And there's a damn log laying out there that hell that damn log was three foot in diameter on the ground. That damn thing never slowed down. Just right up over it. <laughs> and damn the thing I've ever seen, you know, just about, <laughs> well, not the, not the worst, but uh, we couldn't believe it. And, uh, uh, and I've seen them do that over a wide. That's apparently something they do naturally all over. I've seen that happen in widely different areas of the country. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. What a show yeah. this has been. Larry, do you have any final words? Oh, yes. Be safe. Yeah. Eat your vitamins. Yeah. Your Wheaties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boy, it's close to your bedtime, isn't it? <laughs> it ain't close. I'm already there. <laughs> no, we appreciate Kumbo coming on here. And I'm proud to, to be on out. here. We hope to get out with you sometime. We know you got yeah. an entourage of about 30 people you run around with. Uh, it's hard hard to get in the middle of all of them, but well. You're always welcome. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you're always welcome. In fact, well, y'all need to come down here. We need to have a we need to have a camp out down there on the on the river and uh let y'all let let my boogers throw some rocks at you. <laughs> I'm ready. Can I'm we ready. go can we go to Lawler's barbecue and get some barbecue? Yes, sir. We can. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hell yeah. Them, them stents are holding up then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll be uh, getting yeah. them soon. I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A cardiologist told me today, he said, he said, some of that stuff you ate, he said, that's just like shooting cheese whiz in your arteries. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kumbo, we are yeah. we are just thrilled to have you on. It's yeah. always good to see you smile and seeing you feeling better. 
And we're not going to talk about it now, but uh, I'm going to be talking to you real soon about a trip that I'm going to be making down there to see you with a friend. And uh, so we'll, we'll be talking about that soon. And we, we just want to thank you again for for coming on and we thank the world of you. And it's just same here for you guys, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy it when we're when we're together, and I like it even more when we get to get out and beat the bushes some. Yeah, definitely. you need to take care of yourself, Mark. I do, I do. I'm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm Mark. Quit eating them double cheeseburgers. <laughs> now hold on, now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. uh, we we want to thank everybody for tuning in. We've had well over 300 people on here just uh-huh. during the live chat. And and we, we thank everybody. And we will see everyone. Uh, different back channel on Larry's Beast of the Woods. It's my but turn again. It's your turn again. Oh. And... But it's the same bat time. So, (laughs) night, night, footers. See y'all. like to support beast tv check out our gear we have coffee mugs face masks gators shirts and tank tops the link is pinned at the top of the comment section everything is always marked down 20 percent so come check out our junk This has been a Sawdust Production.